Welcome. I'm Terry Combs Orm, the Urban Child Institute Endowed Professor at the College of Social Work at the University of Tennessee. And this course is presented to you uh, to provide some background in science and human behavior. I'm happy to credit our two institutions that have been so good about helping us with this. The College of Social Work is the only college of social work in the country that bases its entire human behavior in the social environment series on the latest neuroscience and genetics and epigenetic research. So we're pleased to share that with you. And we are pleased to note the contribution, both financial and supportive, uh, the Urban Child Institute in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis is lucky to have the foundation, and you can see some um, of the work they're doing at the urbanchildinstitute.org. So in this course, we will begin by reviewing a little bit about basic genetics. It might sound like high school, if you can still remember high school, uh, but it will be helpful to us as we go forward and talk about the epigenetics if we've got this background just right behind us. So most of us remember Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk who originally came up with the whole idea of studying genetics as it relates to traits. He had been a gardener since he was a child and is now considered the father of modern genetics. He discovered how genetic information is passed down from parent to child using pea plants. And pea plants were pretty ideal for this kind of thing because they breed quickly. Their traits are obvious to look at, unlike human beings. If you look at the picture of the pea plants, you'll see the flowers can be purple or white, and the, the position can be axial or terminal on the plant, and the length can be long or short, and some other things like that. So he bred various types of plants to see what would happen with the uh, daughter plants. Now, you don't need to worry about this, but it's kind of important to understand it when you see it, when you look at genetic reports. This is called the Punnett Square and was invented in by 20th century English geneticist Reginald Punnett. This technique sort of helps you understand how dominant and recessive genes work. So what you see here is the mother plant on one side and the father plant on the other side. Capital letters represent dominant alleles, genes. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And small letters represent recessive genes. As you can see, they recombine in many combinations and the only way you're going to get the small g to be expressed is if you get two of them. We'll talk about that in a moment. So each parent plant has two alleles for any particular trait, flower color, stem length, any of that stuff. And when reproduction occurs, the pair of alleles separate and recombine in a random kind of way. So here you can see some examples. Even if both parent plants are red, for example, because there is a recessive white allele in there, daughter plants can be white or red. They're more likely to be red when, the, uh, when there's any version of uh, the red gene there. But this example shows you that they can recombine in many, many ways. This happens independent of genes for other traits, and this will become apparent later on why this is important. Traits are not necessarily related to each other. 
if they're on different genes. So a child may look just like his mother, but have his father's personality and intellectual ability. So now let's talk about the terminology a little bit better so you can remember. An allele is a version of a gene. So you'll often hear somebody say, oh, she has the genes for blue eyes. And what you really mean is she has the, the allele for blue eyes. The gene for eye color has several different alleles, and one of them is for blue eyes. So the thing that's important to remember, and it's hard to talk about genetics without making it sound too simple, is that there are almost no traits or disorders that result from a single gene. So when you hear on te the television news, oh, they found the gene for Alzheimer's or some other condition, what they really mean is they found one of the genes related to Alzheimer's in some cases. Doesn't make a very exciting headline, though, when you say it that way. So earlier we talked about the, the P's. Alleles can be dominant or recessive, as we discussed with the P's. So a dominant allele, such as brown eyes, will be expressed even when other trait alleles are present. So with uh, a version of brown eyes and a version of blue eyes, you're probably going to come out with brown eyes. So you can have it, your eyes will be brown if both alleles are for brown eyes or if you have an allele for brown and one for blue. Recessive traits such as blue eyes only occur when both of the alleles and the recombination are for the recessive trait. So let's look at some pretty commonly understood dominant and recessive traits related to genes. Uh, blue eyes, um, hair, curly hair is actually dominant, long or straight hair is recessive, uh, red hair is recessive. Uh, a child who gets at least one version of the allele for dimples will express those. Earlobe uh, connection is another one. You can see whether the bottom of your earlobe is connected or detached, and that has to do with the alleles that you got. So we talk about DNA a lot, and I think we know what it is, but we may sort of forget how it works in the grand picture. So DNA is nothing but a varying sequence of proteins. And I've noted those here for you, but it's not really important to know the difference, but you will frequently see pictures like this one that you see, or you'll see pictures to represent genetic code, and you'll see A, T, G, and C lined up in different sequences. That, those are the proteins and the different sequences, how they combine, makes for the different traits that we're talking about. Now you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each pair contains one from mom and one from dad. The 23rd pair determines sex. So the... Um, Recombination tends to be random. So even if you have six girls, those were random tosses of the dice, and you are lucky. <laughs> now, genes are the basic physical and functional units of heredity. They're the ones who code for those four proteins. You have two copies of every gene that you have, one from each parent. And as you can see in the picture, genes make up the little segments of the DNA material in your cells. 
we all have heard of genetic mutations, and I think we need to understand about those. They occur when a gene is damaged during division. Cells divide all the time in the body, and every division is an opportunity for a mistake. So chromosomes can be repeated or deleted accidentally, um, or a substance or experience can mutate a gene. Most of us have many genetic mutations. Most of them have no effect at all because fortunately redundancy is built into the system. So one of the things that isn't as clear when we talk about genes or when we hear reports of research in the media is how genes do what they do. And it's quite simple. Every cell of your body has identical DNA. That's important to remember. But as you can see here, or as you know, not every cell in your body turns out the same way. How does that happen? Although every cell in the human body contains the same DNA, different chemical signals at different locations cause genes to be expressed differently. This is an important fact that we will discuss in detail later. This actually turns out to be a major reason uh, that it's so important for social workers to understand genetics. And we'll get to the details of that in just a moment. So I thought it was important for you to at least have heard and understand uh, some terminology that you'll hear once in a while. Here you see again the sequences of A, C, T, and G. A polymorphism is a variation in alleles that occurs when cells make an error copying themselves to form new cells. A single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, is simply a polymorphism located on a single nucleotide or DNA base pair. SNPs are the most common types of genetic variation among people, and they are passed on from parents to their offspring. Ancestors, common SNPs, uh, people in the same family have common SNPs, just strips of DNA that are uh, different maybe from other people, but alike in the family. SNPs are not abnormal just because they are, may differ from other people's sequences. They are one of the ways that human beings become different from one another uh, over generations. So a common, both common terms you hear genotype and phenotype, you need to be able to distinguish between these two. Your genotype you might think of as a roadmap. It's the code that your body uses to um, lead to all your traits and that kind of thing. But your phenotype is what actually gets expressed. So imagine a roadmap showing um, the trip from Knoxville to Nashville, Tennessee. But right in the middle of the road, there's a roadblock due to some kind of accident. Your phenotype is like that. There may be changes, so you have to, you know, you're going to have to find a new route to Nashville, just as your body will come up with a different expression of the gene. We'll talk about that a lot in a moment. It turns out to be extremely important. Well, you may wonder, because you hear all the time about genetic research uh, in the media, how do they do that? I think there is an impression that genetic research is always um, done from blood and massive kinds of expensive, highly technical uh, analyses. And the truth is that most of the stuff you read about genetics does not come from that kind of research. 
it begins, for instance, with the question, is something genetic or not? And in the beginning, when someone wondered whether breast cancer is genetic, they began just by looking at a whole lot of people, uh, maybe a random population, finding those people who were diagnosed with breast cancer and seeing if their relatives were more likely to have breast cancer than the rest of the people in the sample who did not have breast cancer. If you find that 50% of the relatives of someone with a disorder also have the disorder, but only 20% of those who don't have the disorder have relatives with that disorder, it suggests genetics. So you might then go to the next sort of stage in genetic research. And we call that gene mapping. Now, we're going to talk in a minute about the Human Genome Project, where we discovered that humans have about 30,000 genes. So if we know or if we suspect because of the distribution of breast cancer that it's a genetic disease, we can't test every one of those 30,000 genes. That's extremely expensive and has only recently even been possible. So one thing we do is look at haplotypes, which are just sequences of genes that are common in some family members. And we choose some likely markers for genetics for breast cancer. So we've mapped the gene, so the human gene, so we know where uh, in the map, we know where the reproductive system genes are. We know where the genes for development of breast tissue are. And those are our likely places to start. So if it's genetic, we're most likely to find the genes in those places. Now the thing to remember though is that because of that, when you when you read about research that has identified several genes, let's say, that have uh, something to do with breast cancer, since we haven't mapped the entire genome for breast cancer, that doesn't tell us whether there are some other genes that we wouldn't think of that might be involved. And the fact is that gene expression is often dependent on having a combination of several genes. So we still have a lot to learn about um, how genetics cause disease. Remember again, we talked about uh, the parent genes combining. Recombination is pretty much uh, the miracle of life. It basically is when the genes from two different individuals through sexual reproduction combine into a whole new set of stuff. It's also sometimes called crossing over. Here you see a, a representation of how that would look. Uh, you've got the, the gene on the left and the one on the right represented by different colors. When they combine, you can see that you can get different combinations of red and blue uh, representing those, those differences. Again, remember that this is random. So that's one reason our species has survived. We've been randomly combining in ways that work out with the environment over the life of the species. Now let's talk about that a little bit in terms of human beings. So I have my mother's height, or lack thereof, and her cheekbones, and her extremely high energy level. But I have my father's nose, unfortunately, uh, I have his very steady temperament. Um, and interestingly, I have my grandmother's blue eyes. I have a grandmother on both sides with blue eyes, but both of my parents are brown-eyed. 
and I'm in fact the only grandchild among eight combined on both sides of the family who ended up with blue eyes. This is really due to random chance and recombination. So remember you've got 26 pairs, one from dad and one from mom, and they split and combine in all different ways. As you look at this picture, think of the mother's genes as being the circles and the father's genes being the triangles. And when they recombine, you've got this wonderful brand new person that has a little bit of each of, its, of his parents. Now, it's a complicated combination of genes and characteristics and potentials that we inherit, but the environment actually determines how those things will unfold. So as you look at this picture, you see a child on the left with all kinds of possibilities, and I couldn't get them all on there, but remember there are um, 30,000 genes, so lots of potential. Um, possibly the potential for both high energy and low energy. The potential to be very verbal or to be very nonverbal, to be shy. Uh, all kinds of characteristics and the potential is right there in the child. The environment will determine to a very large degree which of those genes get expressed and in the child's phenotype. So notice here that we have a child uh, who had the potential to be very talkative, and maybe he is talkative, but as you see, his parents think children should be seen and not heard. So how will that affect the development of his characteristics? He has musical talent, possibly from from his father or his mother. Um, his aunt, who lives with the family, plays the piano. There's one in the home. Maybe she will give the child piano lessons. So this child's musical talent may be expressed, whereas the very same combination of genes in another household might never be expressed. Notice, too, he lives in a very safe environment. He's got a high energy level. Uh, there's an activity center in his neighborhood, so he can express that high energy. In another kind of environment, the same child may not develop the same. So this child hates music, and maybe, I mean, his father hates music, and thinks a boy shouldn't play the piano. That's a sissy thing to do. He doesn't want the child to develop his talent. Will things develop the same way? Possibly not. Now let's broaden the environment. So here's a very simplistic illustration of a child born with a million possibilities, as all children are. He can be clumsy or he can be an Olympic athlete. He can be shy or outgoing can be a very calm person or someone who's extremely reactive to his environment. He can be artistic. He might stutter. All of these possibilities are nothing but that, genetic possibilities. His environment over there is going to help determine which of those things develop. So in this picture, the child lives in poverty. Will he be able to take music? or art lessons to discover his talent. I often think when I see a crowd of children, I wonder how many Picassos or how many Mozarts are walking around in that crowd of children. And the ones who are never exposed to experiences to develop those talents will not develop those talents. So maybe, as often happens in a poor neighborhood, his parents are too distracted to nurture him as he needs. Um, nurturing is, is to some degree a luxury when you don't have to go out and work 16-hour shifts uh, at a fast food shop. Um, maybe a school teacher will provide the nurturing. When he experiences childhood trauma, 
This child will not have the support he needs to heal. And research shows that social support, when offered with, when it occurs with trauma, can buffer the effect of that trauma. A shy, lonely child in this neighborhood may seek out a game to find the family he can't find at home. Nothing is certain. These are all possibilities that will unfold based on the environment. Now, we'll talk in a minute about how that happens. So, on the other hand, the same child in another poor environment may be able to reach his potentials. It isn't all about parenting. The environment involves everything in a child's life. So a close-knit community may help buffer the effects of trauma. Uh, he may have a non-reactive temperament, so he doesn't react as, as strongly as some children anyway. Uh, a school teacher or a school janitor may encourage his musical talent. Services in his neighborhood, uh, such as after-school playground programs, may protect him from some of the negative influences. Same DNA, different possibilities. Now we've talked about a poor neighborhood. Um, look at the child in a middle class, advantaged neighborhood with competent parenting. There is no guarantee of good outcomes, of course, uh, but don't the possibilities look better? So, I want to repeat again, because it's so easy to, to get confused about this, that multiple genes determine each trait in interaction with the environment. We usually don't know which genes are involved, all of the genes that are involved, so we'll probably miss some when we think about it. The environment influences which of the genes we have uh, are actually expressed and in a little bit, we're going to talk about how that happens. It's a purely biochemical process, and we will talk more about it in a few moments. I want to briefly remind you, because you hear a lot about it, uh, about the Human Genome Project, which was a worldwide cooperative effort to map the entire human genome. The idea came from the early 20th century, when somebody, um, Alfred Sturdivant, first mapped the gene of a fly. Um, then Francis Crick and James Watson, of course, discovered the double, double helix of the DNA molecule in 1953 and, were, and shared the Nobel Prize. A lot of stuff still had to happen, though, before we could look at the human genome. Uh, and it had to do with technology. So we came up, the uh, Human Genome Project finished earlier than ever anticipated, largely because it was such a worldwide effort. And there were a few surprises. So humans have actually a, a little bit fewer than 30,000 genes. And we, being as we consider ourselves at the top of the food chain, expected that we'd have many, many more genes than that. We have, in fact, 200 times fewer genes than amoeba. So how on earth could that happen? And this takes us back in a moment to epigenetics. We also found in the Human Genome Project that the complex architecture of human proteins um, far surpassed the complexity of the proteins in animals' genes that serve the same function, called animal homologs. So that gave us a clue that there was something going on other than the number of genes and how complex human beings are. We also discovered, to our surprise, that only a tiny fraction, about one and a half percent, of the human genome was made up of protein coding regions. Now, we had always figured that it would be the entire genome. Uh, more than 50 percent of the gene 
of the genome consists of repetitive sequences that we arrogantly called junk DNA at first because we did not know what they did. Now, the Human Genome Project did discover a lot of connections to disease. Um, before it ever started, there was this great anticipation that it was going to discover the cause and lead to the cures for virtually every disease human beings have. That did not happen. But we did find a few interesting connections for some very common uh, diseases that you see here. One thing that uh, we've probably all heard of are the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, where certain mutations cause very early onset uh, cancer of the breast and cervix. Uh, only about 10% or less of breast cancer is genetic at all. And what's interesting is that uh, these mutations run in families, but not everyone in the family who has the mutations will end up with breast cancer. The human gene map is now available to everyone on the Internet. So you can look up specific conditions to see if they're linked to genes. You can see a map of which genes are involved. You can read some research about those genes. Uh, and if there's something of particular interest to you, you can set up alerts to learn when new things are found out. Here are a couple of very good online resources uh, to learn about this. Uh, but you can also just Google Human Genome Project or Human Geno Genotype Map and come up with some wonderful resources to learn about this. Thank you very much for your attention, and I encourage you to take a little break and then go on to the next set of slides in this lesson. Thank you.